All right, our next panel is going to be talking and discussing about the economic empowerment of individuals through NFTs. Please give them a round of applause. Awesome, so happy NFT NYC everyone. We're talking about the economic empowerment of individuals through NFTs. And I think we're just gonna start out with some introductions here. So first we'll start with Mercedes and, and go down this way. Hello everyone, my name is Mercedes Mercedes and I'm a partner at Lightspeed. Lightspeed is a venture capital firm based in Silicon Valley and we are investing out of 17 billion right now across all of our geographies which include the US, India, China, Southeast Asia, Europe, the Middle East and Latin America. And we have invested in companies on the Web2 side like Snap and Affirm, on the Web3 side like FTX, Solana, Polygon, Alchemy, Arbitrum, Royal, uh, Autograph, and Control of Football. It's, it's a long list. We, we've been investing in blockchain since 2013 and have about 60 investments. Awesome. Thanks, Mercedes. I'm Austin. I go as Super Gay Dad in Web3. I'm the co-founder of Galactic Gaylords, an LGBTQIA NFT project looking to bring more representation and diversity to Web3. That's awesome. Both of you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, how are you doing? Uh, my name is Lisa. I'm Venezuelan, and I help the communities in Spanish to, with the onboarding process, because now I'm trying to uh, like reduce the fears that we already have, like reduce the intimidation that, that the new technologies cause to most everyone, everybody. So I'm focusing on that. Um, NFT collector, web free, total deep heart believer. So I'm here to connect with you guys and help you with whatever you need in the um, Latin American community. So thanks for being here. Hey, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the Latins are here. Latin nice. America. Vamos. So I'm Charles Brigham. I'm actually a poverty reduction specialist and international development expert. I've worked in uh, different capacities from NASA to uh, World Bank to UN to CARICOM uh, for many different governments, lived in 15 countries, spent most of my career outside of the U.S., focused on development technology, uh, and I'm really happy to be here with the panelists to, to share my story and, and, their, and hear their stories. Yeah, thanks for that, Charles. And you've done a lot already for people of lower socioeconomic statuses with your tool, MicroWallet. So maybe tell everyone a bit about that and your journey getting there. Yeah, so thanks, Austin. Um, I'm pretty boring in person, actually, but um, this is an interesting project that I kind of, I'm a, I tool around and I started a faucet with a friend uh, four years ago. It grew um, two years ago. 15,000 users, grew again, flipped it into a wallet, um, started to get that wallet established, grew into 40,000 users, all from poor and marginalized populations. The focus was to educate uh, those populations on the use of crypto in their everyday lives, as many of you may know what a faucet is, but that's now evolved and they've learned how to use the MicroWallet platform and I've been involving that since to educate them on the ability to uh, use cryptography to explore their creative side, which is another part of my vision of creating a more sustainable future, which is, how many of you know what the sustainable development goals are? Anyone? Okay, well, they're the, the goals that every government has signed on to achieve by 2030 for a more sustainable future. My premise to do this is to educate people to explore their, to allow them to explore their creativity through more inclusive autonomous means and the blockchain allows that to happen in many different ways. So I've established another part of MicroWallet which is called Mumba, which means creator in Swahili. That part of the company, company organization focuses on empowering that same MicroWallet community who is educated now to expand and and absorb their art and creativity in a way that allows them to express it in a way that will be autonomous and allow them to own that work. So I'm really trying to focus on poverty reduction at the core, 
with the ability to expand that poverty reduction for a more equitable world for everybody so that we can see a planet that thrives as nature does in biodiversity for a planet we've never seen. Thanks. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing, Charles. Round of applause, that's awesome. You're not only onboarding people, but you're also empowering them to become creators as well. And I think that's something that we need in this space. And Lisa, I know that you also are obviously part of this panel for entrepreneurs, but you are looking at bridging the gap between Web 2 and Web 3 and kind of seeing where our traditional businesses can integrate Web 3 for entrepreneurs and their economical empowerment. Yeah, well, that's uh, one of the main goals that I'm being focused on lately, like in the last six months, because most of us like struggle with transitions. Like I remember when we used to start with the, using the internet, like you, we were all afraid to use it because we could get scammed, they can get our information. So, and nowadays we buy, a, we buy everything online. So those transitions are gonna be always complicated to have it. But as, if we make it easy for the people, easy for the community to know the technology, know about the blockchain, learn about how to get a wallet, how to be safe in the environment, they're gonna be more open to join us and, and start even like including it in their business ideas, for example. And you can do, anything with the blockchains, everything is possible. Uh, most of the time, like when uh, clients and people approach me, I was like, okay, I'm a yoga teacher. How can I use an NFT in my world? It was like, everybody can. Like if you're already having tickets, if you're already doing courses, if you're already like attending, uh, I don't know, meetings with clients and new, uh, launching new products, that can easily become a, an NFT or another representation of the Web3 uh, technology that you can use. Uh, they're using it now for ticketing, for example, music, sports, like sustainability, as, as your guys just mentioned. So that um, it's just finding your way to make it easier for you and your community to get involved in your projects. Everybody's open to support you if they feel that they're connected to it. Um, and the economic empowerment, uh, will it will come anyway. I mean, you're putting, you're putting your effort in web to developing uh, social media, the marketing campaign, like this, the values and, and mission of the company, and you're already communicating that. So you're just using a different space and different environment to express and bring that value that you, you are bringing already in Web 2, and just migrating that to Web 3 and, and expand as much as you can. Yeah, that's amazing. I love what you said. It will come. We all know it's on its way. And if we stay here building and onboarding people, we'll be able to empower them to use Web3 in lots of different ways in their Web2 businesses. So amazing. Feeling comfortable using it. Because sometimes yeah. like, you get, sorry that I interrupted you, but it was like the number one step is like reduce their fears, reduce the intimidation that they have at the technology. If you're talking about, if you do it to techie, for example, and you're talking to someone that it's the first time they are listening about NFT, you can start the conversation talking about like, oh, this is a blockchain and this is how it works. So you go with like, what do you do? What do you like? What's your business in real life to say somehow? And then you can like walk them through, I mean, walk them with you in the process of how you can use the technology and make it so easy as you already are using other type of technologies and, and processing in this moment. Yeah, and that personal connection is so important, whether it's Web3 or wherever we are. Yeah, and now I guess I'll chat a bit about me here. So when it comes to economic empowerment, I think there are a lot of underrepresented groups in Web3, and that's why I started my project for the LGBTQIA community. But one really amazing thing about Web3 is you're able to put yourself forward with your Web3 name and create a new identity for yourself. You don't have to lead with your credentials, you can lead with your passions. And I feel very fortunate, I live in Canada, and I'm out, I have a husband, I have a daughter, I feel very fortunate where I live. But there are so many people in parts of the world where it is punishable to be queer. And those people can't be themselves, but also they can't find work being themselves either. So Web3 is creating this opportunity for everyone to truly be their identity, but also be able to work globally through Web3 and empower themselves to create their own communities and their own economical sustainability while still being able to be themselves. Yeah, and now we'll go to Mercedes for, uh, tell us about the environment and what we can do to empower people with that. Yeah, so my focus at Lightspeed, I think of myself as an investor where my whole passion and purpose in investing is to invest in underrepresented communities that I care about, that I think are not getting as much access to capital as, as they should. 
and to think about as a consumer investor, what are products and services that can help individuals build wealth so that they can go on to do whatever they want to do. That's like my whole mission and focus. I always tell myself there's no one else in venture like me and I think that that purpose and, and passion is really important. And how that dovetails with crypto is that when I saw crypto first coming up, you know, I was it really excited about it because the communities I care about it were really excited about it. You know, there was a stat like 30% of uh, black investors in the US at last year owned crypto when the larger percentage of the general population owning crypto was much lower. It was like 10% or, or less at that time. And that tipped me off to, oh my goodness, this is a tool, the separation of state and money, that people are utilizing to go about you know, counter, counteract our, um, the, the state in order to build their wealth. Same thing, I, I lead our investments in Latin America for light speed, I'm a tiny part Colombian. And I look at my communities, my family in Colombia from San Andres, it's from a small island there, and also in Brazil and in Argentina and Venezuela where we invest, um, that they're utilizing crypto as well to, to circumvent maybe currency controls or, or other areas. So when I think about economic empowerment as an investor, I try and find those startups that are building those products for those communities and then, okay, let's give you capital resources to make sure you can figure it out, scale to millions. I absolutely love that. And just dealing with underrepresented communities, I think NFTs and the blockchain in general uh, give us a chance to write our own histories because so many times um, a culture is kind of lost in translation, whether that's through a language barrier or through stereotypes or whatever it may be. And now we have the opportunity to just really tell our stories in the most authentic way possible and make sure that it isn't getting lost through some type of filter. So for all of us here, what do we think are the one or two things that we could be doing right now to empower people economically? In NFTs, I, anyone, jump in. I mean, uh, from my perspective, it's all about education. You know, um, if people are educated, they're able to make wiser decisions. And, and that education has to come with many different things. You know, uh, we here in the West don't understand what education really means until you are in a place that doesn't have access to education. So when you're in those environments, uh, you start to understand that they, those systems that don't exist, we've taken for granted. So me growing up in Oakland, California, um, I did not know what I had until I had an opportunity to travel and see the world in different ways and different peacekeeping operations and humanitarian situations. So I got to see the level of desperation and uh, stay in those environments until I fully understood it. After staying in those environments, you start to be able to provide your own viewpoints on how to support and educate people. And me being in the background, you know, I'm a past developer, you know, Python and JavaScript and other ancient action script languages. But in any case, the, that helped me establish relationships with other people in that same space, but that didn't have the means to get an education. That's exactly how I became familiar with the blockchain. I was in Indonesia with a friend of mine, and he said, hey, let's build some let's build some things on the Ethereum chain. So we did. I ended up doing and that kept cascading. And this is a person that was not educated through traditional means, but had the ability and will and interest to focus on that specific thing to generate his own livelihood. And that taught me a lot about the ability for the blockchain to support education and to onboard people that want to learn. And if you can find that, which most everyone has, tap into that, that's where you can generate the most value. In my work, I don't do any social media outreach. I don't have a marketing budget. I don't even, I mean, I have barely started Twitter after four years, but I, it continues to grow because there's an easy way for people to comprehend and absorb it in their everyday life. I don't have an answer of why, but that seems to work. And I try to tailor it as I go um, so that other people can you know, be involved in it. Of course, I'm here to tell you, I don't know what the, 
I'm doing. You know, so I'm new to all this too. Like all of us up here, maybe with the exception of a few. This is a new opportunity and we need to let everyone have access to it so that we can all prosper, not just a few of us, which is why the price is down is actually a good thing, you know, in my opinion. But that's controversial, I'll pass it over. Yeah, and that's so key, I'm just gonna jump in, having those authentic voices and getting those viewpoints, because if you try to run a project on your own, you only have your own perspective, but when you can get everyone from around the globe into this, you get so many pers perspectives, and when you have multiple solutions, you always come up with the very best solution. So are you. Yes, it's a crypto COVID. <laughs> Everybody, if you don't know this project, it's one of my favorite projects out there. Launched Halloween last year. I won't sidetrack us too much, but definitely check out the crypto covens. I have several and I love them. This one, I'm trying to look more like her. You'll need an eye right in the, the center of your head. Yeah, okay, well, back to it. Um, Lisa, what do you think we could be doing right now to empower people? If there's like one or two steps we could take away. First step, push on education. Like push to reduce the, the fear barriers, the struggle that you have, because everybody start in the same spot. Like, some, so, like you mentioned, like some of us are maybe ahead, others are a little bit uh, behind. But even like if you go to smaller communities, like uh, like for example, uh, communities in Spanish, like most of the time, all the content and the knowledge is based in English. So I was wondering, was like, okay, if I already know that this is gonna, this is how it goes, how I can I do? How can I add value and do it in my own language in Spanish? So I'm gonna like push into education to show the people that they can tr do this transition from one spot to another one and make an income and, or, a, or create a business around things they feel passionate about. Because the more passion you feel towards the things you do daily, the better you're gonna have the attitude and the vibe to help others to join the same movements. So when you reduce that, you, when you reduce the fears and you create an environment that they feel that they are educated to make smart choices, they're gonna be more open to um, jump into their passions or join to other communities that they're doing the same things or complementary things that they're aspiring to be or aspiring to do or joining projects um, that, that they feel connected to. So education, edu uh, education will be the number one. And the number two is like create safe environments for those people who are joining the space, they feel comfortable to come to you or to anybody else that they feel related to. So uh, yeah, push education and reduce uh, the fear barrier that you have to to use new technologies. Yeah, and to take on to that, if you can't find that community that makes you feel safe, then I ask everyone here to create that community for you. I joined the Web3 space and I got into Crypto Dads because I was a new dad and I just loved the project because I vibed with the community there. So I tried to find the other half of my identity, which is identifying as queer and it wasn't there. So that's why I decided to start my project. But I want everyone here to start a project because there's people out there who will resonate with what you're putting out into Web3. And when you can find that group of people, you can create something really special. And you can create jobs, you can create economic empowerment for that group of people. And Mercedes, what, what are two, one or two things that we could take away from this? I think for a lot of the builders in the room, some of the things that I, I hope we'll see in the next year or so as crypto um, continues its journey, I know we're gonna be in a fair market and kind of crypto winner, but as you think about, okay, how do we get crypto to the next billion, 10 million, 100 million users and make it, and it increase the, the economic empowerment of everyone? I think we really need great usability and great consumer experience design in crypto. I think this is a large thing holding back the next generation. And, and when I mean generation, I mean the next wave of crypto users joining. I think one of the big tug of um, you know, wars we have to contend with in industry is the dichotomy of decentralization and usability. And for the average consumer, I'm sure many of you have tried to onboard your Web2 friends into Web3, and they're like, what is this? Like, I have to memorize a key, this, 
you know, like this recovery phrase and like, oh, what are, I, they, they just don't get it. And I think we need to think about some of the great principles of Web2 product design for mobile and try to figure out how do we do, you know, Web 2.5 front end solutions, the back end being the Web 3 side, and how do you, over time, you might need to start with a centralized entity as you make important product decisions, but over time, the life of the startup trend towards its decentralization as you grow your user base. I actually think that's a large part of the answer, and maybe I'm, you know, controversial on that, but I think starting centralized, going decentralized, and being more Web 2.5 in the beginning will get us to the masses. Yeah, I think we need to get more into the onboarding and get people in through means that they're already familiar with, because trying to jump right to Web 3 right away is difficult for a lot of people. But I feel like that also brings up, sorry, do you want to jump in? I was just going to say also, and you know, having a decentralized network from the very beginning can make it difficult to build the best product because there's a lot of input. How are you making decisions? Obviously, some people have done it well, but to build a product for the masses, I think that's really hard. Yeah, and when we're talking about onboarding and just like the economic barrier to even get into this space, I feel like there's so many things that are just too expensive right now for the average person to even get into Web3. So what are things we could be doing about that? I know onboarding, we could start doing free tools. Um, with MicroWallet, how do you do your, your onboarding? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, I, I literally don't do anything. Um, we're, we've been growing slowly for four years. I just try to make it super basic and simple. Basic and simple seems to work best. Um, you know, uh, it just, that, that would, uh, so any way that anyone can absorb something in a, a few minutes or less is always the best way to go. Um, I work in huge decentralization systems for web services, for geospatial information globally. Decentralization is, is, is controversial. There isn't going to be a decentralization panacea, but there will be opportunities to decentralize to the point where we can have a better life. And we can do that through collaboration and decentralize, not just in technology, but in the way we think about things. And if we can do that and absorb those methods in our natural world before we translate them to technology, we'll be much better off and not see the, the offloading of profits. If you look at everybody in the room and the people you go and talk to throughout this conference, I would ask you to do one thing. All of us have interests. We're all Googleable. We can find out about each other. And you can look at those people based off their meritocracy and base your decisions on how you work with them that way. And if you can do that, you can find the right web of people to make things more powerful and onboard people of all types to many different things that they're unfamiliar with. So I think that there's a lot of frameworks that allow us to do that. Again, I'm plugging like the sustainable development goals because there's you know, 14 goals, 79 targets, 232 indicators for a better planet. Those are things you can wrap your mind around. There's data models, you can build against those data models. All of the work that you all do, all up here, feeds into those sustainable development goals in some way. So there are frameworks and globally that you can tap into. But there's also local frameworks, which a lot of the panelists are involved in, that also allow that to happen. So that onboarding is what I think everyone up here is trying to do. Um, and I would assume that a lot of the audience as well. Yeah, I think so too. Um, I completely agree. We're getting the wrap it up cue here. So let's go through the line and just say where we can find each other. And, uh, and we'll end it on that. I don't, um, you can find me at, uh, at Mike Wall at one uh, Twitter or um, I'm horrible at getting in hold of so you know you can you can I'm Googleable too and LinkedIn and all that stuff so so you can find him but you might not be able to get in contact with him. Uh, well, in my case, you like I mean you can find me on social media Liza F Lopez it's exactly the same in all platforms and I have a or my podcast Mod Modalidad Remota which I do it for the Latin community uh, helping in NFT and Web3 world. And you can find me just on the web, austinplease.com, gay.blogger, or our project, galacticgaylords.com. And y'all can find me on Twitter. My name is Mercedes Bent, Merce Bent, M-E-R-C-E, 
B, E, and T. Yes, it's like the car. And, or email is great. Can I just, I, I have to be fair. At Biosphere007 is my Twitter, my personal Twitter. So that's literally my Think it like would be here. followers. <laughs> awesome, thank you everyone. Thank you everybody. Round of a hand for our speakers. Woo!